Hello. For security reasons, I will tell you my name is Ruben, although it is obviously not my real name. All you need to know is that nowadays, I am an important Spanish TV actor. The world of television is quite complex. You meet all kinds of people, some of them with very high egos. But I never met anyone like Jake. Let's start with the fact that Jake was not someone famous. He was a normal person who was participating in a reality show. At that time, I had no TV experience either, and I was willing to meet all kinds of people. Little did I know that I was about to meet evil personified in a person. A person who, without being particularly violent, gave me the worst time of my life. It all started when we were on a reality show. The program was called Around the World and consisted of doing challenges in different parts of the world. Many times we filmed live, got into fights, and had some short circuits with other contestants. As I told you, I was a novice at this TV thing, so I was looking to get into unnecessary fights just to get a little more camera time. Oh boy, I really picked the wrong person to fight with. Meet Jake. He was a young adult who had entered the reality show with his girlfriend. They both kept a pretty low profile. Jake didn't seem to bother anyone, but he still had a weird aura that made you not want to be around him. I don't believe in auras, energies, or anything like that. So I found an opportunity and critiqued him during a live shoot. I remember that it didn't seem to bother him, and he quickly avoided the situation. Seeing that nothing was happening, the program host got bored and moved on to another participant. At that moment, when the camera wasn't looking at either of us, I noticed his piercing green eyes pointed at me. This person was angry, but it was a terrifying anger. It was a cold and calculating anger, as if he knew he was going to hurt me, but not at that moment, but when no one could help me. By the time we finished filming, everyone was heading back to their hotels. By that time, my fear was gone and I was thinking about something else. Can you blame me? I thought it was all over there. That by the next day, we would be starting from scratch. But no, it was at that moment. That moment, that moment, that moment, that moment, that moment. It was at that moment when I was walking alone in the recording studio that I knew I had messed with the wrong person. I understood why no one wanted to get close to Jake besides his girlfriend. That person was really dangerous. And by the way he was walking behind me, menacingly, he knew it too. I thought about taking the elevator, but I figured he would too, so I hurried and took the stairs. To my surprise, Jake also walked up the stairs. He was clearly following me, as he was walking at exactly the same speed at a distance where he could stare at me. We kept walking until it was too obvious that he was following me, and that's when I decided to get my courage up. This little guy was not going to intimidate me. Hey, do you have a problem staring at me so much? You were looking for a fight earlier on the set. You shouldn't have done that. It's a reality show. You know it's not personal. <laughs> I know. Still, though, you shouldn't have done that. It might have been an innocent encounter. Nothing might have happened. But I was really terrified. There was something in his eyes that told me I was not safe. That this wasn't over yet. I went back to the hotel and took a cold shower to try to forget everything and not be so paranoid. I tried to convince myself that this situation was over. I would soon realize that I was very wrong. The days after that was pretty normal, except that I felt that Jake wouldn't take his eyes off me. His girlfriend was also staring at me all the time, saying things in his ear. I tried to avoid them as much as I could, but I also felt that he didn't make any effort to run into me. Until that day. That day I was walking alone after the recording day. I got on the elevator to leave the place, but before it closed, someone reached in and locked it. It was Jake. He got on the elevator with me and pushed the button to the first floor. The elevator closed its doors and quickly started on what would be the most uncomfortable ride of my life. The only good thing was that, even though it was silent, the ride was coming to an end quickly. But all of a sudden, the elevator stopped. At that moment, I looked at Jake's hand he had stopped it. Hey, what are you doing, Jake? Why did you stop the elevator? Without giving me any kind of answer, Jake just stared at me with a huge smile. I started to feel very uncomfortable. 
I was never one to shrink from anyone, but this time I felt like prey. Prey to a really dangerous man who was playing with me. In another situation, I would have really acted out and gotten angry, but this time I was terrified and he knew it. Totally confused and baffled, I didn't know how to react. I just froze. Jake's arm slowly rose up to my neck and suddenly, without warning, the hug turned into Jake violently choking me with one arm. I tried to resist. I kicked, tried to break free, even to hit him, but nothing made sense. He held the position without any effort. When I was about to run out of air, when I was already seeing everything blurry, Jake let go and grabbed my head with his other hand, only to slam it violently against the closed elevator door over and over again. All I could do was cry my eyes out, begging for my mom as the psycho brutally beat me and smashed my nose against the door. After pushing a button, the elevator returned to its original position and Jake whispered something in my ear. This was your last day with us, boy. After saying those words to me, Jake took me to the stairs and pushed me. The fall was horrendous. I felt every bone in my body being damaged with every foot down the staircase. Once I hit the ground, I simply couldn't get up. My foot and arms were broken from the long fall. And while one person who heard me fall came to my rescue, Jake simply walked away with a huge smile on his face. As I was being rescued, I didn't accuse Jake or try to get him arrested. I just lay on the floor with my broken bones, scared and crying as I asked for an ambulance to be called. Shortly thereafter, I resigned from the program. I was contacted by some of the channel management to ask me what happened that time. They asked me if Jake had anything to do with it. But out of fear, I decided not to talk. I was no longer on the show and had no relationship with him. It didn't make sense to risk the cycle coming to finish what he had started. A short time later, I found out that Jake had been kicked out of the program. The reason? The production found out that when he was young, he had murdered his parents in cold blood. In addition, he was suspected of committing acts of violence and intimidation on the TV set. Everyone was afraid of Jake, and it wasn't just because of his presence, but because, at one time or another, they had been in a situation similar to mine. As I told you before, today I am a famous TV actor. I will not reveal my name, although if you have the memory, Jake will remember me just remembering the story. I know that by telling this, I am putting my life at risk. But you know, it's very hard to keep this up over the years. I just wanted to get this weight off my shoulders and move on. And I hope that after this, I can. Debbie and Cameron Merrick were a happy couple with a little daughter. Not a month ago, they had moved into their new home, which was on a bigger property than their old house. Debbie and Cameron were very eager to decorate this house, as this was their first home that they owned themselves. They had checked out the best stores in their town and a few neighboring ones, but were unable to find the decor of their liking. Once, as they were passing by a street, Cameron noticed a small thrift store tucked in the corner of a large building. The store looked odd, but from nearer inspection seemed to be filled with antiques, perfect for their home. Debbie was a bit reluctant to have thrifted stuff in their new home, but Cameron convinced her to give it a try. As soon as they entered the store, they were surrounded by different things. Cameron started taking a look at the things, and reluctantly, Debbie started doing the same. After an hour of browsing through the store, Debbie had found nothing to her liking. The thrift store was full of garbage, which seemed to be older than her. Cameron, however, loved old and antique things. If it were up to him, he would become an antique collector. While Debbie was ready to leave, Cameron walked up to her with three dolls in his hand. Before they could even have a word, Debbie had already decided that she disliked the dolls just by looking at them. They seemed old and weird for some reason. But the excitement on Cameron's face was out of this world. Babe, 
I think I found the perfect pieces for our home. I mean, I know the dolls are a bit old, but they seem to be valuable. And down the line, if we don't like them, we can always sell them off for a profit. When Cameron spoke to the shopkeeper, he told the couple that the dolls were made out of porcelain and manufactured in China. Cameron thought that the dolls had value, and they would add character to the house. So he bought all three of them. Debbie did not oppose it, as she did not want to disappoint her husband and kill his excitement. When they made it home, the couple was unsure where to place the dolls, so for the time being, they decided to let two of the dolls be in a storage unit and place the third doll in the living room. Their daughter, Sarah, wasn't a big fan of these dolls either. She loved her Barbies and her teddy bears, but not this doll. A few days after purchasing the dolls, a weird incident happened in the Merrick household. The smoke alarms in their house kept going off for no reason. At first, the couple thought that maybe there was a fire somewhere in the house, but after checking the whole property, everything was fine. The alarms were still beeping, so Debbie removed the batteries from one of the alarms. Just then, the smoke alarm in another room started beeping loudly. Dismissing this as a technical glitch, they ignored it, even though, in the back of Debbie's mind, something did not feel right. Days passed, and the smoke alarm incident was long forgotten, when one night Debbie was woken up by the creaking of floorboards. The whole flooring in their house was wooden, and some panels would creak if someone walked on them. Debbie, Cameron, and Sarah had their rooms on the first floor, but the floorboards were creaking on the ground floor. Debbie thought maybe Sarah had gone downstairs to drink water or grab a late-night snack. So she decided to check on her. The moment she descended the stairs, the creaking stopped, and everything went quiet. Debbie walked into the kitchen, and nothing was amiss, nor was Sarah there. She checked the living room and the adjoining washroom and storeroom, but no one was there. However, when Debbie was about to go back to bed, she noticed the doll sitting on the couch, which Cameron had placed on a showcase the previous night. She dismissed the thought and went back upstairs. But before going to bed, she checked on Sarah, who was fast asleep in her room. It did not seem like she was snooping around downstairs. Debbie's suspicion was growing, but she did not want to sound like an idiot, blaming all the weird incidences on a doll. However, what happened next made both Cameron and Sarah believe that there was something wrong with the doll. One morning, Cameron woke up with some pain in his leg. When he checked his left leg, he almost screamed. Cameron was a brave man, but sometimes even being brave is not enough. When he pulled his pajama pants up, he noticed several scratch marks on his leg. The scratch marks were angry, red, and deep. However, how did he get these scratch marks? Debbie and Sarah were by his side tending to the injuries when Cameron spotted the doll sitting in a chair in front of his work desk. How did this doll get up here? I remember leaving it downstairs last night. Debbie and Sarah exchanged a look and finally opened up to him. In the past several days, we too have noticed weird things happening in the house. And every time an incident happened, the doll is somewhere around, Debbie said. When Cameron picked up the doll from the chair, he noticed that the scratch marks were similar in size to the doll's hands. The whole family had had enough, and they decided to get rid of the doll. They listed her on eBay in the hopes of finding a buyer. And in the meanwhile, they placed it in the tool shed outside of their home in a wooden box. Everything went back to normal after the doll was out of their house. One evening, Debbie needed a tool from the shed to fix her leaking sink, so she went out there to grab it. However, when she entered the shed, she forgot all about the tool and was baffled how the doll had gotten out of the wooden box. Moreover, the cross necklace that they had placed on its neck was removed and discarded beside the doll. Debbie ran out of the shed, and that's when the Merrick family decided to get help. Their story made it on the local talk show, and the couple, along with the doll, 
were called in for an interview. They brought the doll on set, and before the interview began, they placed it in a rocking chair between them and the hosts. While the couple was busy narrating the whole story to the hosts, who were extremely skeptical about the couple's claims, something extraordinary happened. The doll, which was still on the chair, suddenly began rocking the chair. The hosts noticed it and pointed it out to the audience. However, the audience had already spotted it before the hosts could. Soon after that, the interviewers wrapped up the interview and sent the couple home with their haunted doll. After the show was aired, a lot of people contacted the Merricks for the doll, but the couple was hesitant to give the doll to just anyone offering money. As they had understood, this doll was not normal, and in the wrong hands, things could go south really fast. Until the day when a famous paranormal investigator who was affiliated with the church offered to take the doll off their hands. The couple was overjoyed that they had successfully rid themselves of the haunted doll. Neither Debbie, Cameron, or Sarah ever tried to find out what happened with the doll as they had suffered enough. To remind themselves of the horrors that they had endured, all they had to do was look at Cameron's left leg, which still had the scars from the deep scratch marks made by the haunted doll.